morning and good morning. Welcome to Edmonton Baptist Church, those of us in the sanctuary, and of course, warm greetings to our friends on Facebook, YouTube later on, and CDs. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord, and especially today, it's our harvest festival, and I just draw your attention to the wonderful display of which I'll say a bit more later. So welcome, and it's a 10.30 service in case you're wondering. Uh, please let friends and family know. 10.30, Edmonton Baptist Church, and it's really good to see you this morning. Can I remind you, as I did last week, we are now in the season of deacons' elections, and there are five places to be filled. Nomination sheets are available at the front in the foyer, and uh, there is a list also advising of people who are eligible. So please have a look at the list, and if you are led towards asking somebody, pray about it, and ask the person that you have in mind would they be willing to stand? Also, um, the forms, nomination forms, have to be in by the 17th of October. So we're talking about two weeks and a bit. This is important kingdom business. It's important church business. Please prayerfully think about who would fit the post. Five places, deacons elections. Um, Operation Agri is part of the celebration of harvest, and this year the focus is on Uganda. So we have a short video just to promote that and to show you what's happening. And I have a special soft spot for Uganda because I have very close bonds with some Ugandan people. So you can have the video, please. I did not have much on my farm, not enough food, not enough money, even buying salt was a problem. On the radio, I heard Pastor Shayalimpa Paul speaking. I called him and requested to join the SAFI project. The SAFI stands for Sustainable Agriculture Farming Initiative. Small-scale farmers were very, very poor because their production was very low. Before we joined SAFI, as you can see, it is sloping down. There was runoff of water, it was being washed away. We were cultivating, working hard, digging and planting crops. We had a very poor yields, and this was very stressful. And we've been training these community farmer trainers in each phase for two years. We're in the fourth phase. The project is doing well. That's our zoom. Now, at last, I have learned how to farm, and Safi gave bananas to plant. They grow really well. We are supposed to have an animal to give us manure, so for us, we decided to have rabbits. It has been very, very good. We learned how to make compost manure, manure from the rabbits. When I started with the project, they gave me a goat. The good had kids, and I sold some of them to pay for my children's school fees. Now we have plenty to eat and to sell at the market. I thank God for the Safi project. On my land, I grow food and many other things. Thank you very much. So that's a taste of Operation Agri. That's the project for this year. Envelopes are available in the foyer and more details online. Can I also remind everyone that Pastor William is still looking for volunteers to help with the book table. This is our evangelistic um, initiative and the book table will consist of Christian material just in front of our building, and we will be looking to evangelize to passers-by at large, but also in particular to engage with Muslims in the area. 
So Pastor William will be waiting at the front after the service and is looking for volunteers to assist with the book table. And lastly, just to say our English classes are up and running two weeks and last week I'm happy to report there were four people who got very enthusiastic and um, knowledgeable attention. So please let people know 9 to 11.30 every Monday classes are at no cost to the learner and um, we're just looking to get a few more people and it will be beneficial to everyone. So I think that's everything. We entrust these notices and these projects to God's tender care, and we pray that he will send his blessing as we move forward in his name. Let us pray. My God and my Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can gather. There are many who would like to proclaim your name today, Father, and are are unable to do so because of restrictions and legislation. Father, Lord, where two or three are gathered together, we know that you are here. So, Holy Spirit, move amongst us. We welcome you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless our efforts and that we would remember that all that we do here today is to your glory and to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand now for a call to worship. The words will appear on the overhead and we will all read together. Our call to worship. Beginning. O oh God, who desires good for all creatures, satisfy our hunger, not just for food, but for freedom, truth, justice, and love. O risen Christ, you revealed yourself to us as one who gives to the poor and cares for all people. We dedicate our lives and our offerings to your service. O Holy Spirit, bless these gifts so that our gifts and our actions may live out our faith glorify God and bring forth a fruitful harvest for the kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please take your seats. And um, I notice a few more of us have gathered, so welcome to our Harvest Festival. And um, if there's anybody who's joined us recently online, services are at 10.30. Right, so earlier on, I just drew brief attention to the, the wonderful display that we have in front, and I just want to spend a few minutes looking at it, talking about it, and thanking everyone who has made a contribution. I know there are um, donations and contributions still coming in. Special thanks to Catherine, there she is. Um, and uh, a small team, but largely Catherine, who has helped to put this together. Let's have a hand for the display. And did the camera pan over so that our friends online can see? Excellent, excellent. We always do a good spread, whether it's eating or harvest. We always do a good spread. But you know, um, we're a city church, and we know that the contributions today will go to two things. Our breakfast club, which is run on the premises here on a Wednesday, and has in fact been running for about 10 years, so that's a good milestone. And also divided with um, Millgrove, which is a house for children and young people uh, locally. So that will continue. And that is why we've asked largely for non-perishables. However, although we're a city church, we've got plenty of country ways. And you can see some of the country ways already. The produce is here. But I also wanted to just give another view 
the, the allotments and the gardens among EBCs. People are very busy. You wouldn't believe how busy people are. So this week, Tuesday in fact, I asked for some pictures, people to send pictures in. And there was a flood, an abundance of pictures of produce that people have grown this year on their allotments and in their gardens. Thank you very much, everybody who contributed. In the end, I had to say, stop, we've got plenty. But thank you so much. So we're going to have a look at, the, at a video which also shows our country ways, allotments and gardens. Thank you. Amen. Thanking God for all his provisions. And thank you, EBCers, farmers, and gardeners. Thank you for your hard work. And, it, you know, God is bountiful. He blesses us abundantly. And we, we give thanks at this time of year, this traditional harvesting time. Um, I'm just going to ask maybe one or two people, three or four people, to give short prayers, please, of thanksgiving. And as we thank God, also to remember those who may not have a harvest. So people who may not have clean water, for example. Anybody, as you feel led, and when the time is right, I will round up with a prayer to round it off. So anybody, one or two lines?
to the Lord and you turn your backs to me. You are the provider. You are the creator. You are the great I am. Father God, we thank you for all these provisions that you have provided. Father God, I don't know what we would do without you, Father God. So forgive us, Lord, when we don't thank you. But we just want to say this morning, and not only this morning, thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Great God, God for the ages. You created the heavens and the earth and the seas and the trees. And you created all good things for us to eat, Father God, and to enjoy. So we just give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you honor to your name. And we thank you for our brothers and sisters, Father God, who, who so diligently and good and found these things and you have them to grow them to teach them. Lord, we thank you that we can depend on you here and on the hour. You are because you were the God of God and Lord of Lord and King of Kings. We thank you and we praise you. We magnify your holy name in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, we thank you. You hear the prayers of the faithful, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that our words would be made into action and that we will strive to love you and to work for you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. One last round of applause. And now it's time for our children and young people to go to their classes. On the 13th, to the back, behind uh, Pastor Isaac. And did I say on? The, yes, 13 plus. Pastor Isaac, please. And on the 13th, this way, with uh, Elizabeth, Ingrid, and company. So lovely to see children in church again and things uh, moving as normal, going to their classes, hearing the word of God. Well done. Come along, you. Come along. Follow through. Thank you, Lord, for these young souls. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Right, so we're going to... Um, sing our first song, and it's a song called We See the Fruitful Harvest. So it may not be immediately familiar in terms of the words, but the tune will be familiar. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. So on that note, I'm going to ask you to stand, please. <laughs> and just so we get a little familiar, familiar with the tune and the words, we're going to have the first verse played, no singing unless you're humming quietly, and we're going to have the chorus played because the chorus is just slightly different. So listen, first verse and chorus, then we'll start at the beginning. Thank you, Neil. We see the fruitful harvest how gracious God provides And how in His abundance Our needs are satisfied And this is the chorus. All the harvest creation brings you praise So we will join the joyful song of everything Okay, got it? Okay, let's try. So we're starting at the beginning, and please join in full-throated praise to our God and Father. We see the fruitful harvest, how gracious God Lord of all the 
your seats please did you enjoy that good and um, Christine will now come to lead us in our intercessory prayers thank you Christine good morning church how are we this morning giving thanks and praise amen so this morning's uh, prayer, uh, I'd like us all to join in with a short uh, response, and I'm going to test you all. We're going to say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So when I say, Lord, you'll continue with Lord in your mercy. Okay, let's, have it. let's try first. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Our Lord and maker of all things in heaven and earth, we come before you today with humble hearts in this season of harvest and thanksgiving. We're grateful to be in your presence this morning and thank you for the freedom to be here. We give thanks for those present today, those watching online and accessing us via a range of media beyond the walls of this church. We ask, Lord, that our service will be a blessing to all participants and speak your peace into the hearts of many. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we give you thanks for the many gifts you have bestowed upon us in, this, in the natural world, for plants, for trees, rivers, streams, and valleys. We pray that we be good custodians of this planet and that we respect and value all that you've created and given to us. Inspire us, Father, to look after the world in which we live, preserving, protecting, and respecting the environment which we all depend on. Help us to ensure fairness for all peoples on this planet, for indigenous peoples of the Amazon, communities affected by mining around the world, and especially in Africa, and those ad adversely affected by cl climate change. Father, be our great provider. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Glorious Father, we thank you for harvest. Thank you for the food we eat, for those whose hands are involved in farming, 
processing and delivering goods to us. Thank you for the many involved in charities, providing food for those in need. Father God of grace, we pray for a nation committed to eradicating poverty at home and around the world. Lord, we ask for fairness in food distribution so that all families can have what they need to raise children without hunger. We pray for families here at home that their food needs are met and that we show compassion for those who may be struggling as the nation's furlough scheme comes to an end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God and Lord of Harvest, we bring to you in prayer those who have very little to celebrate. We pray for those who are hungry and thirsty in our world. We pray for the homeless, those living in fear, those living with domestic violence, who's struggling with those struggling with mental health needs. We remember those fleeing persecution from Afghanistan, from China, and other places too many to name. We pray for those in conflict with their families, for children, for parents, and those keeping families safe. Lord and guardian of the needy, be the hope for those in trouble. Merciful God, through your servants, may love and compassion be found by those who need hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, giver of hope, we pray for our nation, which continues to be affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Be with our health professionals, schools, colleges and workspaces as they work together during this challenging time. Be with our leaders to help them make good decisions, to make our society a fairer one. We pray for our nation's recovery and that looking out for each other remains a feature of our lives. We pray for those who are currently, who are recently bereaved during this season, for those who are unwell. We pray for justice for the marginalized, the poor and the forgotten. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. We pray for the citizens of Edmonton and Enfield. We pray for abundant blessings for your servants in this church our pastors, leaders, and helpers in this church. We pray for the deacon nominations to go smoothly and that the, the reopening of the nation's church settings reaches out to serve people locally. We remember those in our church who are sick and recently bereaved. Lord, be their comforter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And, and as we ask, Lord, for your divine intervention for those who really need you today, we lay every personal problem at the cross and put our faith in you today. We ask for your forgiveness for sins committed and offer our individual prayer at this time of need. And finally, Lord, we also ask that today's message will speak to the hearts, speak to our hearts so that your love, your peace, and your justice lives in our hearts always. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Accept these prayers in the name of your, your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Christine. And now we continue with our prayer, our praise, and our worship. We have another hymn. Come, ye thankful people, come. And may I ask you to stand as we join in to sing.
Before George uh, brings today's reading, I want to add to our praise and our thanks for our financial gifts. We at Edmonton Baptist Church, we have been fortunate, God has been wonderful, and we have been able to keep everything going. Um, so let us pray for our offerings. Father God, we thank you for the faithfulness of the people of Edmonton Baptist Church for the community of saints here, who sometimes under adverse conditions are always willing and faithful with their offering. Lord, we thank you for unexpected gifts and we praise your name, Lord, for meeting our needs just as they become apparent. So Father God, we thank you and we ask that you continue to bless us here and all other Christian communities and charities as we go through with the Lord's work. Amen. Amen. And George will now bring us our Bible reading. Morning, church. One thing that springs out to me this morning is this wonderful harvest that we've got. This must be one of the biggest harvests that we've had here before Edmonton Baptist Church. It's really nice to see. This morning's reading comes from one of the minor prophets, Amos, uh, chapter 5, verses 18 to 27. How terrible it will be for you who long for the day of the Lord. What good will that day do for you? For you, it will be a day of darkness and not of light. It will be like someone who runs from a lion and meets a bear, or like someone who comes home and puts his hand on the wall only to, to be bitten by a snake. The day of the Lord will bring darkness and not light. It will be a day of gloom without brightness. The Lord says, I hate your religious festivals. I cannot stand them. When you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not accept the animals you have fattened to bring me as an offerings. Stop your noisy songs. I do not want to listen to your harps. Instead, let justice flow like a stream and righteousness like a river that never goes dry. People of Israel, I do not demand sacrifices and offerings during those 40, 40 years that I led through the desert. But now, because of you, you worship images of Sakuf, your king god, and of Kairan, your star god, you will have to carry those images when I take you into exile in a land beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is Almighty God. This is the word of the God. Now I'll ask Pastor William to come forward as he brings us today's message. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Greetings. Greetings. Uh, I will quickly want to start with a word of prayer, so let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, those are very strong words that we have read, Lord, and we ask that you now speak to us 
what you want to say, Lord. Open our hearts to be able to hear you, Father. And God, I pray that the words that I speak may not be my words, but be your words. Because your words are the only one with power, Lord. And it is your name and your glory that we proclaim. No one else's. So be with me, Father. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, for those who have been with us for, for a bit, you'll know that we are going through the uh, 12 prophets. I, uh, I told my father, oh, we're going through the minor prophets. And he said, well, they're not minor, they're major. All right, Dad. If he's watching, they're the 12 prophets. We call them minor just because they're shorter. That's, that's, that's all there is to it. So we're going through the 12 prophets, and uh, we are uh, in Amos. But if you remember, last week we did Amos, so why are we doing it again? Well, there's more to Amos, and there's more to the prophets than what we give them credit for. So this week we thought it'd be good if we stay just one more time in Amos to hear those quite tough words that we, we heard Last week, Pastor Stephen, reminds, Pastor Stephen reminded us to seek good and not evil. That is what God wants from us. That, and that's not only here in the church, but also where we live, in our schools, in our workplace. Do good, not evil. Everywhere we are, everywhere we go, we are to do good and not evil. There is no divide for the Christian between Secular and sacred. And if you remember, secular meaning non-religious. Sacred meaning religious. No, for the Christian, it's all religious. It's all about God. It should be. So today we continue in Amos. So let's remind ourselves, who was Amos? Amos was a prophet of God, right? And he was sent to the northern kingdom. And if you remember, after King Solomon... The, the, the land was divided into two kingdoms, northern kingdom, which they called Israel, and the capital of Samaria, and the southern kingdom, which was Judah, and the capital of Jerusalem. So Amos goes to the northern kingdom. That's where he is prophesying. And around 722 B.C., Samaria would fall to the Assyrian Empire, and the Jews and Israelites there would be exiled. So a few decades before that, Amos is prophesying to the northern kingdom of Israel. So just to put it a bit into context. Now, one of the reasons, it's not the main reason, but one of the reasons we thought it would be a good idea for us to go through the 12 prophets is because it would help us to know God better. It is important to know God. God is the most important being, the most excellent being, the most powerful being, the most mighty being, the most holy being, the most wonderful being that could exist and could ever exist. He is worth knowing. In fact, Deuteronomy 7, 9, it reads, Know, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. We are to know him. Psalm 46.10, we know this one. Be still and know that I am God. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. We are to know God. And let me push this even further. The reason you exist, the reason I exist, the reason every single human being, whether they know it or not, exists on this earth is to glorify God and enjoy Him. That's the reason. That's the reason you're here. That's the reason anyone is here. We are to glorify Him and enjoy Him. So in order to fulfill your reason for being, which is to glorify and to enjoy him, we are to know him. And I wonder how, how many times do you think about those things? 
How long do you meditate on the purpose of your existence? I think we would be good if we were to, to take some time and think about that. Why am I here? To glorify you, Lord. Now, why do I say this? Because we will see in a minute that the Israelites, even though they had the law, they had that revelation, it seemed like some didn't really know him. I pray that we not do the same. I pray that EBC be a church where the knowledge of God just overflows and we are desiring to know him. It is easy to keep an idea of, of who we think God is, but it may not be one that's biblical. I pray that God helps us to submit to his word and let the Bible shape our idea of who God is and not what we think God should be. That way, we can truly know him, truly glorify him, and truly enjoy him. So as we go through this passage, I ask that the Lord show himself to us more and more. So let's look at the first section, which is from Amos 5, 18 to 20. How terrible will it be for you who long for the day of the Lord? What good will that day to you? What good will that day be to you? For you, for you, it will be a day of darkness and not of light. It will be like someone who runs from a lion and meets a bear, or like someone who comes home and puts his hand on the wall, only to be bitten by a snake. The day of the Lord will be darkness and not light. It will be a day of gloom without any brightness. So Amos is speaking to the Israelites. He's saying this. It's going to be terrible for you. The day of the Lord is not good. It's bad for you. It's gloom. It's not brightness. It's darkness. So there's two questions we need answering to understand this. First of all, what exactly is the day of the Lord? Secondly, why is it going to be bad for them? Why is Amos warning them it's going to be bad for them? So what exactly is the day of the Lord? So as we go through the 12 prophets, it is used in various books. It is used in Joel, for example. Pastor Stephen was preaching it on a few weeks ago. So more often than not, the day of the Lord is about judgment. Now it can have a meaning of the future judgment, which will be at the end, which we all know. But it could also mean an immediate judgment. In Joel, for example, God sent the locust plague. And that was judgment. That was the day of the Lord. But it was also a preview of how it will be at the end. So it has those two layers going on. It's, there may be an immediate day of the Lord, but there's also one final, ultimate day of the Lord where God will judge all. So that's what the day of the Lord. Now, with it, it comes that God will judge and will bring victory. So the second question is, if the day of the Lord is going to be judgment against these nations that rebel, then why is it going to be bad for the Israelites? Why are they to fear it? So Amos is correcting an understanding that the Israelites had of the day of the Lord. They thought, right, God's going to come, he's going to destroy all the countries, and we're going to rule. We, all the nations will bow before us because God is going to give us victory. And he's saying, no. No. Just because you believe you are the people of God does not mean that God won't judge you too. He's saying, woe to you. For the day of the Lord will be when God judges sinners, no matter where they're from, be it Israelites or not. And they're saying, well, surely we are his people. He's not going to judge us, right? Will he? And yes, anyone, anyone who rebels against their maker, no matter where they come from. They were so assured of themselves that they believed that God would never judge them. That they would always be, that God would always be on their side. Anyone who comes, God's on our side, you're done for. That they were beyond judgment, that all the nations were wrong except them. That they were untouchable. But no one escapes the judgment of God. As we see in Amos 
5.19, it goes on. It will be like someone who runs from a lion and meets a bear, or like someone who comes home and puts his head on the wall only to be bitten by a snake. No matter where you go, it will find you. Sounds scary, doesn't it? Phew, I got away from that lion. A bear comes and attacks me. Phew, I got away from the bear. I am safe at home where nothing can touch me. Let me catch my breath and lean against the wall. A snake bit me. There is no escape from this judgment for those who rebel against God. You may think you got through it, but no one will escape it. No one will truly, decisively escape God's judgment. So that's how Amos concludes. Verse 20. The day of the Lord will bring darkness and not light. It will be a day of gloom without any brightness. See, the Israelites did not truly know God. Because if they knew God, they would know what God demands. We read in Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? God himself. God was not their lucky charm or their personal servant or their genie. That's how he was being treated. God, we, we pray for you and you give us stuff. That's how it works. That's how it works. I want stuff, so you give it to me. And God will not be treated that way. We are to be on his side, not the other way around. We are to pursue his goals. We are to proclaim his name, his glory, and his kingdom. And for that, we need to know him. You may think you know God because you've been going to church all your life. You go to Bible study, oh, I know God. I've been coming to church, of course I know God. Then I ask that you take a moment by yourself at home to truly look within your heart and say, do I truly know him? Do I really want to know him? And all who he is and what he's done for me? Or, or will I just go about my own business? Just worry about my own things? Ask yourself if Jesus Christ is your Lord. Ask yourself if you've given your life to him. Amos is declaring, is declaring this woe to those who would presume on God, to those who believe that there's, there's peace between them even though they are rebelling in, their, in his face. They say, on the one hand, bring the day of the Lord so we can have victory. But on the other, they say, I'll do what I want. Don't tell me what to do, God. I will follow my own rules. So I pray, may he show us mercy and lead us to the path of true worship and true knowing. This leads to our second section of the passage, Amos 5, 21 to 24. The Lord says, I hate your religious festivals. I cannot stand them. George read it very well. When you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not accept the animals you have fattened to bring me as offerings. Stop your noisy songs. I do not want to listen to your harps. Instead, let justice flow like a stream and righteousness like a river that never goes dry. I pray that that's not how God reacts when we worship. I pray, Lord, take our worship. Be pleased by our worship. Notice, it's not saying he's indifferent to it. I don't care what you do. He's saying, I hate it. I hate it. I despise it. Those are strong words. Very harsh words. Why? That's the question. Well, why? Why do you hate it? Why do you despise it? You can imagine the Israelites saying, see, God can't judge us. We bring we have festivals. We worship him. We, we sing him songs. We bring the best animals, those really fattened animals. That's what we bring. How can he be mad at us? I mean, he owes us. We do this for him. He does stuff for us. That's how it works. And then, bam, the Lord answers in a very strong tone. And it should hit us. 
But why? Why the strong reaction? Why didn't the Lord approve of their worship? And the clue is in verse 24. Instead, let justice flow like a stream and righteousness like a river that never goes dry. Pastor Stephen reminded us a bit of what what, uh, the Israelites were up to in those days, so let us quickly read through them. Amos 6, 13 reads, You brag about capturing the town of Lodibar. You boast, saying, We were strong enough to take Karnam. That was them. They thought they did it. See, we're going to boast. We did it. On our strength. But we know that it was God behind it all. He's the one that gives them victory. He's the one that prospers them. And they should boast in him. But they were boasting in themselves. Also in Amos 2, verses 6 to 7, the Lord says, The people of Israel have sinned again and again. And for this I will certainly punish them. They sell into slavery honest people who cannot pay their debts, the poor who cannot repay even the price of a pair of sandals. They trample down the weak and helpless and push the poor out of the way. Amos 4.1, listen to this. He says, you women of Samaria who grow fat like the well-fed cows of Bashan, who mistreat the weak, oppress the poor, and demand that your husbands keep you supplied with liquor. That's an awful picture. That is what they were doing. Amos 5, 12. I know how terrible your sins are and how many crimes you have committed. What did they, what did they do? That you persecute good people. Take bribes. Take bribes. And prevent the poor from getting justice in the courts. And finally, Amos 8, verses 4 to 6. Listen to this. You that trample on the needy and try to destroy the poor of the country... You say to yourselves, we can hardly wait for the holy days to be over so that we can sell our grain. When will the Sabbath end so that we can start selling again? Then we can overcharge, use false measures, and fix the scales to cheat our customers. We can sell worthless wheat at a high price. We'll find someone poor who can't pay his debts, not even the price of a pair of sandals, and we'll buy him as a slave. I hope the picture is clear. Israel was being unjust in their dealings. They were neglecting the poor and needy. They were only thinking about themselves, their wealth, their security. They had no time for anyone but themselves. And God is upset. He says, for this, I will not accept your worship. He hates their religious worship because they have no justice and no righteousness. Now, why is that a problem? Why can't just God accept my worship and not tell me what else to do outside of that? Why does he have to demand more? Why does he have to demand justice and righteousness? Can't he just be pleased that I go to church and I go to Bible study and that's it? Why does he want more? Won't that make it okay? I mean, I'm giving up my Sunday morning for him. What's the problem? Psalm 24, verses 3 to 6. Who has the right to go up to the Lord's hill? Who may enter his holy temple? Now let's talk about worship. You go up to worship. So who can do that? Those who are pure in act and in thought, who do not worship idols or make false promises. The Lord will bless them and save them. God will declare them innocent. Such are the people who come to God, who come into the presence of the God of Jacob. Psalm 15, same question. Lord, who may enter your temple? Who may worship on Zion, your sacred hill? Those who obey God in everything and always do what is right, whose words are true and sincere and who do not slander others. They do no wrong to their friends nor spread rumors about their neighbors. They despise those whom God rejects but honors those who obey the Lord. They always do what they promise, no matter how much it may cost. They make loans without charging interest and cannot be bribed to testify against the innocent. Whoever does these things will always be secure. I read that and I'm saying, sometimes I don't measure up to that. And I have to say, Lord, forgive me. 
Show me mercy as I enter into your church to worship you, Lord. God requires that when we come to worship him, that our hearts are also in it. It is not just what we do, our external actions, but it's also our inward leanings, our inward worship of who he truly is and what he truly demands from us. Another of the 12 prophets puts it like this, Hosea 6, verse 6. I want your constant love, not your animal sacrifices. I would rather have my people know me than burn offerings to me. There it is. There it is. That's what he wants. That's what he was telling the Israelites, and that's what they were not doing. They weren't truly seeking to know him. They were just giving animal sacrifices and expecting victory as a, you know, a deal. I'm dealing with God. He doesn't want your empty religious worship. He wants you to know him, to love him. He wants a relationship with you. If you're coming to church, if you're coming to this church just to gain favor with God so then he can repay you, don't come. Don't come. If you're only coming to socialize with others and that's it, don't come. Don't come. Because these words are going to be said about you. If you're coming just out of habit, because you're used to it, because that's what you do on a Sunday morning, but you don't care anything about God and his word, then don't come. Don't come. But if you're coming, repenting, with a sorrowful heart, but also a joyful heart, knowing that on Christ he has forgiven you, and because of that you want to worship him and show people his love through your gracious act, then come, come. Let us together worship this King of Kings with righteousness and justice. That means that our worship, our knowing, our glorifying him does not end once we leave the building. It continues outside the building. That's what Pastor Stephen reminded us again last week. That there is no secular or sacred divide. It is all about God. Everything you do and everything you don't is about God. A verse that pulls it all together is in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. If we obey God's commands, then we are sure that we know him. If we say that we know him but do not obey his commands, we are liars. And there is no truth in us. But if we obey his word, we are the ones who love, for God has really been made perfect. That is how we can be sure that we are in union with God. If we say that we remain in union with God, we should live just as Jesus Christ lived. There it is. We should care about injustice. We should care about what we see on the TV, corruption, racism, sexism. Those are things that we should be moved about but because we know that's not right. That is not what God demands. In our worship, we are to live a life that shines the light of Christ everywhere we go. In who we vote for, if people are telling you, you have to vote this way, don't listen to them. But if God is telling you, vote this way, that is how you vote. When you go into that booth, you think, what would God want me to vote for? Show me, God. I believe we need much prayer when we come to vote. In our driving, in our work, we are to strive to see no more exploitation, no more oppression, no more small print in the contract where I can say, I gotcha. No more manipulative advertising. They trick you into buying things you don't need. They trick you into giving your money and losing it, gambling. No more of that. These are things that as people of God should stir us up. We should ask God, show us what to do. So much injustice. How can I be a light and bring your justice and your righteousness wherever I go? Help me. Show us your ways and help me to walk in it. If people ask you and they say, well, why are you a Christian? What, what, what is it that makes you a Christian? Well, I go to church on Sundays. That's what makes me a Christian. Well, that's the wrong answer. That's the wrong answer. What makes you a Christian? that I love God, I want to know God, and therefore, I want to see justice. 
I want to see righteousness everywhere I go because that was God demands from a true worshipful heart. Someone put it a lot better than I could ever do. A ceaseless moral striving, a steady effort to please God must be part of worship. Therefore, the one who worships cannot divorce faith from works or adoration from ethics. To worship well is to live well. This is the idea of the sanctification of life as the creative goal toward which Christian worship must tend. That's what it's about. To worship well is to live well. And that's what the Israelites were not doing. Now, if you read the commentators, when they talk about the religious festivals that they were going through, they'll, they'll probably say it was one of the three big ones that the Jewish people had. They had the, fish, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths. And the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Booths were when the Israelites would give their best bits. They, they, they went, they brought the grain offering, and they gave their best. I mention that because today we're celebrating harvest. Today, the wonderful service that Beverly has prepared has been reminding us that we are to give thanks for what we have. And this is a display to show God our thanks for what he has given to us. But no one can see into a person's heart, only God. And I pray that if you have give, given an offering, that you did it with true knowledge of who he is. Not just said, oh, I have to give something. Let's see, let's just pick something that's out of date because I don't care. Because if we do that, that should shock us. Wait, this is, I'm giving this to God. How dare I? They brought, they brought the fat animals. Those were the best. So we should bring our best. And we have here a display saying, God, I do not deserve any of the blessing you give me. And you give me much. I now want to worship you, honor you, love you by giving to those who are in need. I pray that this was a time for you to think about those in need and honor your God by giving it away. And in some small part, being a blessing to those who do not have. Right, almost it, finished. The final, the final section, I'll just touch briefly on that. Amos 5, 25, 27. The people of Israel, I did not demand sacrifices and offerings during those 40 years that I led you through a desert. But now, because you have worshipped images of Sakuf, your king god, and of Kaiwan, your star god, you will have to carry those images when I take you into exile in the land beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is Almighty God. Amos is prophesied the day of the Lord. God did bring judgment to the northern kingdom. It says, verse 27, when I take you into exile in a land beyond Damascus. God did that. God brought that exile upon them. And he says there, it was due to their worshiping idols, due to their sins. So not only were they worshiping God without their heart, but they were also worshiping idols. Let's just spread it around. Let's spread it around. See if someone can give me something. I'll worship God. Hope I get something from him. I'll worship Sakuth. Hope I get something from him. I'll worship Kaiwang. Hope I get something from him. It's all me, me, me. Worshiping idols does not help when you want to worship God with all your heart and with all your soul. So, do you worship the true God? Or do you worship a God that makes you feel comfortable? A God that doesn't challenge you. A God that treats you like you're, like you're, you're, you're their master. A God that only seeks to bring you comfort and nothing else. I can assure you that is not the God we see in the Bible. But all of us are guilty of doing that to some degree or another. Do we emphasize God's love, grace, and mercy? But do we ignore the fact that he hates and despises evil? We live in a democracy and individual rights. Do we ever picture God as the all-powerful king of kings who is to be absolutely obeyed? Have we caused people to be afraid of God by making him a stern judge who's sitting in heaven and watching us so that he can catch us in some small mistake? Or has God become so much a friend and a buddy that there is no majesty or fear? What emphasis is placed on his holiness? 
Do we emphasize the justice of God and thus encourage justice in relationships between genders, races, employees, employers, and nations? Let us turn back to the Bible and strive to truly know him and therefore have righteousness and justice overflow out of our lives in true worship so we can truly live out the purpose of our existence. Let justice flow. It's a water image, isn't it? It's water. And we know that water gives life. So when we're out there being salt and light, also think that we are bringing justice and righteousness. So we, through us, God is bringing life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want your name to be magnified. We want your name to be glorified in everything that we do, Lord. In our worship, in our family, in our school, in our workplace, everywhere, Lord, we want to magnify you. For that is why we exist, Lord. That is why you made us. Lord, help us to bring justice and righteousness to where we go. Help us to lift up the needy. Help us to comfort those who mourn, to show mercy, to bring peace. Help us to do your will and not ours, Lord. Help us to establish your kingdom. We give you thanks for all that you continue to give us, Lord. And we pray that our offerings here may be used to bless others. And Lord, we ask that you forgive us if sometimes in our worship we do not honor you as you deserve. Forgive us when our heart is not in our worship, Lord. Forgive us when we treat you as our personal assistant to just get us stuff, Lord. That you are only there to work for us, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us when our knowledge of you, of who you truly are, is not balanced by the Bible, Lord. Forgive us. Heavenly Father, as we go out, we will continue to proclaim your name, your power, and your honor. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor William. Um, I hope we took time to reflect. I certainly paused and had a good think. You know, we're very pleased to say God is a God of love, and that he is, emphatically so. But God is also a God of judgment, and he's a just God. And we need to take that on balance and to make sure that we do not mock God, for God is not to be mocked. Let our worship be acceptable let us do the right thing for the right reasons. This wonderful display is not just because we're putting some things together because it's the time of year. We are doing it in service to the kingdom. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. See if there be some wicked way in me. Search me, O Father, and let me see. Lord, we thank you, and we pray that the words that we've heard this morning will sink into our hearts, sink into our lives, so that we may truly honor you and our worship will be acceptable to you. Let us remain seated for our final song, and it's a new song for me, certainly. You hear the cry... Um, Geraldine Latty will sing it, and it carries forward what we've heard in the message and throughout the service. Hear me cry, let us listen and reflect. Of 
the child ill treated Thought you hear the cry Of the depressed one seeking Lord have mercy on us Lord have mercy
Amen. May the Lord hear our cry. Please remain seated and I will pronounce the blessing before we go. May God who clothes the lilies and feeds the birds, who leads the lambs to pasture and the deer to water, who multiplied loaves and fish and changed water into wine, lead us, feed us, multiply us, and change us to reflect the glory of our Creator now and all through eternity. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, remain in your hearts and minds now and forever. Amen. The service has ended. Go in peace. Have a good week. Please remain seated while the ushers wait on us. And final reminder, I did sprinkle it in. Services are at 10.30. Praise God.